Well, very good morning. We're going to begin our family service in a minute or two. So if you'd like to, uh, you don't have to stop talking quite yet, but if you want to grab a seat, that'd be really good. Well, very good morning to Kingfisher Little Paxton Family Service. My name is Andrew Barr. For those who don't know, I'm a member here at uh, Kingfisher Church. Before we begin, let me just go through a few uh, practical matters. First of all, what are we going to do this morning? We're going to bring our thanks and praise to our Heavenly Father. And we're going to do that in song and word. And we're also going to talk to God in prayer. And we'll do that at various times throughout the service. And also we're going to listen to God speak to us from his word, the Bible. And the children, when it's the right time, that's when I tell them to go, um, they will be going into their groups um, for their Sunday school or children's group, call it what you will. Um, I'll be leading the first half of this service, and then our um, assistant pastor, Paul Dutton, will be coming to preach to us. And that's when the children will go out into their groups. Um, in terms of um, the loo's toilets, they're through the brown doors where Pamela and Carmody are seated at the moment. So if you want to make use of those, they're through that door, and then turn left and keep going. One other thing, as I mentioned, this is a family service, and families, there are children, so, and we're very used to a little bit of noise, so please, if you've got children, don't be too concerned. A bit of movement, a bit of noise, that's fine. There are, I mean, if you go through there into the lobby, by all means, use that, but feel under absolutely no pressure to do that. Um, we're delighted we meet as a family, and we've got children as well, so that's uh, great. So let me pray now before we begin. Give us the rest of our service. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may the words of our mouth and the inspiration of our hearts truly bring our thanks and praise to you. For your mercies are new each morning. Help us to delight more and more in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray this now. Amen. So what we're going to do, first of all, is say together the first 10 verses of Psalm 145. So if you'd like to uh, join with me, we'll say this out aloud. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works they tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. So why don't we continue giving thanks and praising the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by singing all praise to him. So when the musicians begin to play, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing all praise to him. 
if you wear your mask while we're singing, when we finish, you can take them off or keep them on. The choice is yours. got the Kingfisher Church notices. As you see, now things have got back to normal after the summer holidays. There's various things occurring. And the first thing is this evening at 7 o'clock, we've got evening service, um, which is great because I don't think we've had an evening service for the best part of 18 months. Um, I think so, anyway. But anyway, it seems a long time. So we'll be here in the school, uh, Little Paxton Primary School, 7 o'clock, and um, Rich Fairburn is going to be uh, teaching us from a book of Obadiah, so that's exciting as well. So if you're able to, please do come along. Um, there was today going to be um, just an informal meeting for some people who are newer to Kingfisher Church here at Little Paxton. That's, and that was going to be at 2.30 at the Slater's house. That's now not actually um, taking place. But if anybody wants to ask about that, either ask Rich uh, Fairburn or Paul Dutton, the assistant pastor, um, if you're new or newish and would like to um, just find out a bit more. Um, and also, after the service, if you can go... Anybody who's involved in the sound desk, is that right, Ben? If they, if they could go to the sound desk after the service um, and have a word with them, um, that'd be great. Monday, we have got the coffee stop. That's at the hub. Um, a little packs and starts, 8.45 a.m. That goes on until 12 noon. And um, Pat Law can tell you all you need to know about that. So um, get hold of... Um, 
that, Laura, if you need to know anything more. But that's um, at uh, on Monday, 8.45. Then Tuesday, we've got a men's Bible study, 10 o'clock at uh, Carmony and Pamela's house over at Ellington. So that's 10 o'clock. Then Kingfisher Women, that's also at 10 o'clock. Nikki, do we have a Yvonne? It's at yours, is it? Yeah, I, th- I see you have a WhatsApp group, but I think it also makes a carefully guarded secret, so just for women. Um, so it's at yours, is it, Yvonne? Yeah. Right, 10 o'clock. Okay, and finally, we've got our church family meeting at 8 o'clock here at Little Paxton Primary School. That's 8 o'clock Tuesday evening. And Wednesday, we have still, if you're missing Zoom, you've got an opportunity for a prayer um, what do we call it? Prayer time on Zoom. And that's at 7 a.m. in the morning. That's Wednesday. Finally, Friday, the uh, Kingfisher Youth Group. That's for all those of secondary school age. Um, they're meeting at Mark and Claire Slater's house, and that's at 7.30 p.m. I don't think there's any other notices. If not, we will move on. What we are going to do now is we are going to say we're sorry to our Heavenly Father. We're going to confess our sin. Um, we've been looking at 1 John for a little while now. And in it, he's, we hear, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And as, we sa- as we said earlier on in Psalm 145, we have a God who is full of compassion and graciousness. So that's what we're going to do now. So if you would like to have a look at that prayer on there, just have a read through it, and then I invite you to say it with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our hearts or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offenses, we pray, and make us clean that we may continue as members of Christ in whom alone is salvation. Amen. And let's sing... There is grace to remind us again of our gracious and compassionate God who is loving and gracious and who wants us to come to him. So let's sing when the musicians play. There is grace awaiting me.
world to come, despite the sin that I have done. For there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me. All who call upon the Lord will rise to life with peace assured. For there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me. take a seat. We're going to continue praying now. We're going to bring our requests to our Heavenly Father through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for this, your world and your people in it. People, whether they acknowledge you or not, who all do belong to you. And as we see the world, the beauty of your creation, we are amazed, yet we are also appalled at what we see. Broken, brokenness, broken relationships, broken planet as well. So we bring now to you the world. And particularly this morning, we pray for the continent of Asia, where we have a number of mission partners people who partner in the gospel in that part of the world. We pray for China, particularly the President um, Xi Jinping, and increasingly the increasing crackdown on the church in China, and also in North Korea itself, and in Afghanistan, that fledgling church of yours which began and is now hard pressed on all sides. So we do pray for all of those um, people. We pray for the people of those countries, whether they be Christians or not, that they might hear about Jesus Christ. And we do give thanks for Michaela and Huambe in Myanmar, Burma, where all the troubles continue. And we just pray for a resolution of that, Lord. We pray also for Rebecca in Thailand. And we thank you for the work she's doing to tell people about Jesus. And today we particularly want to pray for Linya and Nam Hoon and their children in South, Co South Korea. We do thank you that Nam Hoon has passed all the exams and the assignments he's had as he studies um, at um, ministry college. We also do pray that you will provide an opening for an assistant pastor role somewhere in a church in South Korea, which he needs to do as part of his training. We do give thanks for the family holiday and the refreshment they had in that time together they enjoyed as a family. Pray for Athia as she starts to attend kindergarten and the boys, the two older boys, as they go to Korean school and all the challenges they'll face with the language. We do thank you for Linya's uh, driving license, Korean driving license has uh, now come through, and we do pray also that her application uh, for the visa will uh, be renewed without too many problems, Lord. So we do thank you for the Lim family as they 
work to tell people about Jesus Christ and live out their faith in that country. And now we turn, Lord, to our own nation. We do pray for our rulers. We pray for the government. We do pray that they make wise and good decisions. Might they look to you, the source of all wisdom. We do pray for Christian charities, particularly the Christian Institute and the um, charity who knows Christian concern, whose tagline is equipping you to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ in today's culture. And as perhaps things get more difficult, certainly not as hard as they are in those parts of Asia I mentioned, Lord, but as things become more difficult to be a Christian in a secular humanist Western Europe, we do pray for the work of those charities to enable Jesus Christ to affect and influence our society, our secular society. Might they hear the good news of Jesus Christ, which is the hope of our nation, which is indeed the hope of all nations, Lord. And we pray for Kingfisher Church, particularly for those who preach your word. And as our covenant states, we will welcome and test biblically instruction from, your, from the scriptures, seeking to grow together in Christ. And we pray that Rich and Paul and whoever else preaches, preach your word faithfully in season and out of season. And pray too for ourselves as we hear your word. Hear your word. May, may we be attentive. May we listen to your word. And might your Holy Spirit be working in our hearts and minds. So that the word of God does the work of God in the people of God through the Holy Spirit. And finally, Lord, we pray for all those who are struggling, who are facing ill health, just finding life very hard. Whatever the causes are, Lord, we do bring them before you. We think of those in our own church family who, uh, are, under t who are being treated for various cancers, Lord. Might they know your tender, loving mercies, and might they look to you, Lord, in this difficult time. For we know that we can cast all of our anxieties upon your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he cares for us. Might we take comfort and trust in Jesus. So, Lord, please accept all these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to have our Bible reading now, and Jane has very kindly um, agreed to come up and um, read, and the Bible reading is 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 5, which is on page 1227 of my Bible. One John 4, verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love has, is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you very much, Jane. 
we are going to sing again. And at the end of this song, if the children would like to go out to their groups. So again, when musicians begin to play, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing Fountain of Goodness, Beauty, Ever Streaming Love. Take a seat if the children would like to make their way to their groups. Good morning. As we, uh, as we just sang of that great love of God, the love of the Father that's poured out on the Son. And, you know, in John's Gospel, Jesus prays for believers as he prays for us, not just for those first disciples. Uh, he concludes by saying, Righteous Father, the world does not know you. I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now this is the prayer of Christ for us uh, and with that in mind, uh, let us pray as we come to meditate on God's word. 
Father, we thank you that you have heard, that you have answered your Son, Jesus Christ, and we pray then in accordance with his prayer, Lord, that the love that you have for him, the eternal love of the Father to the eternal Son, Lord, it may be in us, that he may be in us, that we may comprehend something of the greatness of the vastness of your love, Lord, but more than comprehend that we may bask in it that we or that we may live from it Amen. so then would you rather would you rather run a hundred meter sprint or run a marathon hundred meter sprint or a marathon is is Diana back yet she's done she was was it was it yesterday she was doing a marathon Okay, yeah, well, well, we'll check with her. Would she have rather just done 100 metres or done it? I certainly would rather do a 100 metre sprint. Well, for a start, it's a lot more glamorous on the Olympics. But a 100 metre sprint, it seems a lot more feasible, a lot easier, that short, intense burst rather than that long, sustained effort. I've not done a lot of long distance running, uh, probably none. I think the furthest I've managed is 7K. And I wouldn't say that was terribly enjoyable. And there's a sense, certainly when I, I'm running, I don't know if I've got it within me to keep going. I don't know if I have the reserves to keep this up. I've either got to massively slow down or I need to stop. And have you ever had that similar experience when it comes to loving others? Now, if loving was a race, it would be a lot easier, wouldn't it, if, if loving was a 100-meter sprint. It may be intense, but it's short, it's done. But if love is a marathon, if love needs to keep on going, I don't know if I have the strength within me to keep this up. Now, there's, a, there's a test me that Rick shared probably about a year or two uh, ago. And it still sticks with me, some of the finer details. Maybe not, so Rick can correct me if I get it wrong, but uh, it was, a, was it gap year at an orphanage? Sort of gap year. You weren't doing anything else, but you were working at an orphanage. Where was it? Thailand. Thailand. Uh, and Rick spoke about how this love that he had for the children that he was caring for, this love that God had put in his heart, was such that he found himself saying to God, I would give my life for these children. I would die for them. And God challenged him with this question, but would you live for them? You know, giving our lives for another, laying down our lives, it's the greatest expression of love, we're told. And yet to physically die for someone is a one-off thing. It's intense, but you can only do that once. But to live for someone, to continually Lay down your life for them. Now, I don't know if I have that within me to keep going. I don't know if I have those reserves. Can you resonate with that? And yet, this is what we are commanded to do. And we've seen this command throughout Wong John. That we are to love one another. We are to keep on loving one another. How do we do this? Now, we saw this... Last week, do you have your Bibles open to uh, 1 John chapter 4? We saw last week, verse 7. Now, love comes from God. The love does not originate within us. Love comes from God. Last week, we considered the, the intensity of God's love. And this week, as we continue through chapter 4 into chapter 5, we're going to consider something of the immensity of God's love. Now, if last week was about the fire of God's love, and then this week is about the eternal fountain of his love. How are we to go on loving one another, to keep on loving? Love comes from God. As we work through uh, this passage, and we're going to see what that means for love to come from God, two sort of things to Two foundations uh, to, to help us guide our way through this, and that is a divine source of love 
and a divine sort of love. The divine source of love. Have a look with me. Wong John, chapter 4, verse 13. This is how we know. And just to stop here briefly with this, this is how we know. This phrase, this is how, occurs several times in this passage. One of the things translators have to grapple with when you come across that term, this is how, is the question of, is this pointing backwards to what has been said, or is it pointing forwards to what is about to be said? Is it, there's a statement, and because of that statement, this is how we know, or is it, this is how we know, statement is followed? And in the NIV translation, consistently in this passage, they use it to refer to what follows. So this is how is referring to what follows. However, when we get to verse 17, now I'm convinced by the NET translation, some views of commentators, that it's not looking forwards in verse 17, it's looking backwards to what has been said. Now, if all of that has confused you and you have no idea what I'm going on about, don't worry, that's just me to explain kind of how we're reading this passage and maybe why some of the English grammar in the NIV with the colon might be slightly different when we get to it. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask me later. Otherwise, just park that to one side. But verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So in verse 12, uh, last week, we were looking at how love is made complete. Uh, and love is made complete as God lives in us. So we come here to verse 13. How do we know? How do we know that he lives in us? Well, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. I think the emphasis here is on the his. He has given us of his spirit. We've already seen as we've gone through this letter in chapter 4, you know, there, there are various types of spirit that are referred to. Now, don't believe every spirit we're told in 4.1. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. How do we know a spirit is from God? Verse 2, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And then just drop your eyes down to verse 6. It speaks about the eyewitness testimonies. And we're from God, whoever knows and listens to us. And it says this is how we recognize the spirit of truth. So this confession that Jesus Christ has indeed come in the flesh, this agreement with the eyewitness apostolic testimony. Now just look at verses 14 and 15. And we have seen and testify, apostolic eyewitness testimony, the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Do you see, it's the same thing that is being repeated here. This is how the Spirit of God is recognized, we're told. And yet, the Spirit of God is not referring to just something that God has, has given, something that is approved by God. Verse 13, he has given us of his Spirit. This is God's Spirit. Now, this Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday just gone in our morning prayer meeting on Zoom, we were looking briefly at Exodus 33. And Exodus 33, it follows uh, the sin of the golden calf. So God has rescued his people out of slavery from Egypt. And in the middle of this covenant-making ceremony, as these people are becoming the people of God, they engage in idolatry. And Moses has to go, he says, I'm going to make intercession. You've done a, a grievous wickedness. I'm going to seek to make atonement. And God speaks to Moses and says, I cannot dwell with these people. They are wicked. If I dwell with them, I'm going to consume them. But I will be faithful to keep my promise. Now, I'll bring them into the promised land. But I'm going to send my angel ahead of you. I cannot go with you. And at this point, Moses cries out to God and he says, but if, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us. Do not send us up from this place. Do not move us if your presence is not going with us. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? 
And what will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? See, what is it that distinguishes the people of God? It is the presence of God. The presence of God with a people of God. Verse 12 here in 1 John, how is love made complete? It is made complete by him living in us, us in him, the presence of God with his people. How do we know this? He has given us of his spirit. See, this prayer, this longing of Moses finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And this is what Jesus promised. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to send you another, another advocate, another helper who will be with you always. This is what God did on the day of Pentecost. He poured out his spirit on his church. See, how do we keep on loving And we don't keep on loving from our own reserves. See, the well of our hearts, it often runs dry. But that's not the place where we draw water from. God has promised streams of living water. And these streams of living water are indeed to well up inside of us, but they come from the throne of God, from God himself. And so as we ask this question, how are we to go on loving one another It's not by looking to ourselves, not looking to our own resources as we considered last week, but as this is expanded, it is because God has given us of his spirit. And so verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. And we saw last week that the love of God is seen as a father sends the son. And Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who comes as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, that on the cross, Jesus bears our sins. He bears the just judgment against our sins so that we might be forgiven. And yet, that's not where the story ends. Forgiveness is not the end of the story. Now, what I'm about to say may sound like heresy. And we're all listening now, aren't we? Our greatest need is not the forgiveness of sins. Our greatest need is not the forgiveness of sins. Now, the forgiveness of sins is a deep need. It is a crucial step. But our greatest need is the presence of God. And the forgiveness of sins is for the purpose that we might have fellowship with God. Our greatest need is for the presence of God because it is in Him that there is life. God is love. We cannot love like Him aside from Him. The gospel does not end on the cross. Our greatest need is for the presence of God. As Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us from here. If this is how it ends, if it ends without your presence, then there's no point. What will distinguish us from all other peoples? Look again, verse 16, as it continues. God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. The only way that we can live in love is because of the presence of God. Because God is love. And so verse 17, this is how love is made complete. Now as mentioned earlier, I think there are good grammatical and theological reasons to understand here in verse 17 This is how, is referring to everything that we've just read. This is how love is complete in us. The love of God. Jesus comes who offers himself willingly as a sacrifice for sins in order that we might be forgiven so that God's presence might be with us. God's presence might be with his people so that we would love, not from our broken systems, not from the resources of our heart, 
but from the overflow of his. And this is how love is made complete. And we saw last week, for, for love to be complete, uh, it means that love has fulfilled its purpose. The goal of love has been fulfilled. And we saw that that purpose, that goal of love, that the reason that the Father sends the Son, the reason that Jesus comes, is in order that we might be brought into God's family. That we might share in the family resemblance was the metaphor we used last week. Now, that we might love as Jesus loves, that we might be like Jesus. That is the goal, that is the purpose of love. And so verse 17, paraphrase, love is made complete. God works now to make us like Jesus, to love as he loved. And this is why we will have confidence on the day of judgment. The day of judgment is spoken about in various places in Scripture. It was something that Jesus taught. It was something that the prophets and the apostles taught. And consistently, you know, the day of judgment is a good thing. The day of judgment is presented as a good thing. God is good. God is just. And so the day of his judgment cannot be anything less than good. However, Scripture does present this good event as either an occasion for celebration or an occasion for fear. It's a good day, but it's either an occasion for celebration or an occasion for fear. And we've already seen in Wong John, humanity is divided into these two groups. You have the children of God and you have the children of the devil. The day of judgment is a good day. It is a glorious day. Now, whether that day is met with celebration and confidence or whether it is met with fear depends on which group you belong to. Now, to those who are made perfect or complete in love, and it's the same word that is used. So in NIV, they, they switch between complete and perfect. It's referring to the same thing here. To those who are made perfect or complete in love. In other words, those who share in the family resemblance of God. Now, those who are made to be like Jesus, then it is a day of celebration. It is a day that is to be met with confidence. But to those who are not made perfect, to those who are not made complete in love, those who share in the family likeness of the evil one, those who are like Cain, chapter 3. It is a day of fear. Have a look at verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, complete love, drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is the one who is not made perfect, the one who is not made complete in love. I don't think this verse is speaking about our emotional feelings in the present. No, there are some people who are fearful and they shouldn't be, and there are many people who are not fearful and they should be. The question is not really whether you fear fearful. Now, that might be a helpful indicator, but we know at times our feelings can be wrong, especially if our understanding of a situation is wrong. The real question is not whether you fear fearful. The real question is, do you have a reason to fear? Do you have a reason to fear? And yet God's love is given so that that day may be an occasion for celebration, an occasion for confidence, so that we need not fear. That we can have confidence because God's love is made complete in us, that we're brought into the family to share in the family resemblance, that we might love like Christ even 
to the very end. And all this is from God. Look at verse 19. We love. It's that work of love being made complete in us. We love. Why? How? Because he first loved us. The river of God's love is to flow through us, but it doesn't originate within us. We love because he first loved us. The source of Christian love is not the chambers of our own hearts. It's in the cross of Christ. And so where our sin separated us from God, and it built this barricade against God's love, God's love broke through that barricade. The love of God that is poured out on us, washing our sin away so that the love of God might flood into our lives, flood out of our lives that we might be made complete in love. Because God is love, and he has given us of his spirit. And, and if you don't know that this morning, ask God to reveal his love to you. Ask him to reveal this truth to you, that his love may be made complete in you. In order that that day, that good and glorious day of God's judgment, may be a day that you can face with confidence, a day of celebration rather than a day of fear. We love because he first loved us. And this love that is spoken of, it's not a love that originates within us. It's not a, a human love. It's a divine sort of love, uh, which takes us to the verses we're going to focus in on now, verses uh, 20 to chapter 5, verse 5. A divine sort of love. And in these verses, we see something of what it means to love from this wellspring of God's love. And we return to this repeated theme in Wong John, that to love God Loving God means loving our Christian brothers and sisters. See, loving God means loving others because this is something that God has commanded us to do. And if we love God, we're going to keep his commands. And so, verse 21 of chapter 4, he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Okay, then we might ask, well, what's it mean for us to love our brother and sister? Look at verse 2 of chapter 5. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Seems a bit circular, doesn't it? But let's ask, well, what's it mean to love God and carry out his commands? I think this is where it's helpful for us to remind ourselves, when we read something like Wong John, this is something that people originally would have heard, would have been read to them in a single sitting. It's like a single sermon. It's been weeks since we started in Wong John. So it's always good when we come to questions like this, well, well let's look back and see what has already been said. And what's it mean to love God and to love his commands? There's a focus on two primary commands, so to speak in this letter of Wong John. If you look back to chapter 3, verse 23. 22, it speaks of us keeping his commands, doing what pleases him, verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to, to do God's commands. You see, we cannot love one another aside from following God's commands. We cannot love one another aside from Christ. Because true love, a divine sort of love, is different to the world's sort of love. The world's sort of love is a love that originates within us. And it's shallow and it's self-serving. But true love, 
The love of God, it originates within him. And it's deep. And it's life-giving. And so if we are to truly love others, we have to love from the wellspring of God's love. And we cannot do that aside from Christ. Because a love that originates within us is shallow and it is self-serving. You know, in pastoral ministry, there is always the temptation to tell people what they want to hear. The temptation to always affirm people, now even in their sin. Why? Because we want to be loved. We want to be liked. We want to be affirmed. Like, no one wants to be called a religious bigot, do they? And yet that's not love. To affirm people, even in their sin, is not love. And we saw that a few weeks ago as Andrew took us to the beginning of chapter 4. And what the world often presents as love is a shallow and it is a self-serving love. It doesn't come from God, it comes from the world. Again, just flip back chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 16, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the way of the world is about desiring and seeing and possessing. And relationships then just become a means to achieve that. That's not necessarily material possessions, although in some cases it, it might be. But this possessing of a, an emotional affirmation. I want to feel loved. I want people to accept me. I want people to affirm me. I want to be held in high esteem. I want to be a success. And if we seek then to love from ourselves, from our own resources, it's the love of the world and it just becomes self-serving and it is shallow. If we are constrained by the way of the world, we cannot truly love others. We just use it to love ourselves. And yet there's a better way. Have a look at verse 4. Everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. That way of love, that way of living, those who are born of God, they overcome the world. And who is it, verse 5, that overcomes the world? Well, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hang on, we've heard that already, haven't we? Several times, chapter 3, verse 23, God's commands to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you see? Do you see? This is why. This is why we cannot love others aside from loving God and keeping his commands. Because it's only in Christ that we're freed from this way of loving, the way of loving of the world, this shallow self-love. If we are to love others truly, it is only through Christ. Christ has overcome the world, and it is only in him that we overcome the world. It is only in Christ that we are freed from this shallow, self-serving love of the world. Only in Christ are we given of God's spirit, God who is love. And so it's only in Christ that these streams of living water can flow out of our life. God has lavished his love on us so that we live neither for ourselves nor from ourselves. How are we to go on loving? How are we to keep on loving one another? Well, it's only through Christ. Through the power of his spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great love that you have poured out on us. Lord, that, that your love, Lord, is given for a purpose, to be complete, to, to make us like Christ, Lord, that, that we would love not from the, the shallowness, from the broken systems of our own heart, but from the wellspring of yours. 
Lord, help us to see and to know, to experience more of your great love, Lord, for us. And to be changed and transformed by your love, to live and to love not from our own resources, Lord, but from you. Lord, may we see more of the immensity and the glory of Christ. Lord, and depend more on the work of your spirit changing and transforming us. Lord, that we indeed would be those who love like Christ, who continue to love like Christ, even to the very end. Amen. Well, as the band comes out, we're, we're going to sing once again. We're going to sing of the great gift the gift that it is none other than God giving himself. When God gives us a gift, it's not something aside from himself. He's given us of himself. He's given us Christ. And so that it is not down to us, not our resources. It is not I, but it's through Christ in me. Let's stand together. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this Every breath.